great work, Herit. Th this <laughs> this is really nicely done. I really love the um, the way that you progress the texture across all of the sections, and you sort of brought new life and meaning to each of the restatements. And that was really something that I, I felt was an overall problem to solve for all of our orchestrators taking on a full orchestration of the entire selection. And, you know, that was just like, how do you get past the fact that Barvinsky is just kind of restating the, the theme over and over again with just, you know, differences in accompaniment. And, you know, you really showed that that this can be a progressive work that becomes more and more intense and really pulls in the the listener's <laughs> attention, even though there is a lot of repetitive use of the thematic material. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about what you're doing, though, with this piece. Now, I don't know if you have watched some of our previous um, evaluations. I really hope that you have. And if you haven't, I would just say, go back to the beginning, you know, watch some of the first things that were released on the playlist, and then come back to this. <clears throat> because there are a few, I mean, this is, this is beautifully orchestrated, but there are a few basic errors in here. I mean, and I know you're better than this, right? I mean, that just, there are some, but there are some preconceptions in your scoring here um, that are that you know that are basically ruining the texture right so so for instance uh, you know I've said this before and I'll say it again <laughs> until I am blue in the face and Herit you are way better of an orchestrator to make this mistake okay you you should have watched my 12 uh, <clears throat> my 12 common scoring errors video and know better than to do this, right? And I'm going to make a special video about this. Um, and that is, you really, really, really have to watch out about scoring low flute in a complex texture. Now, yes, everybody's playing very softly here. So, you know, at, at, at the first, the second flute right in here will be somewhat, you know, will have a little bit of tone weight, but pretty much most of it will be swallowed by the English horn, right? Because here, you know, you're sending the you're sending the second flute down into its lowest octave where it is at its weakest. And you know, here you've got bassoons and clarinets, you know, and they and and English horn and they're all very absorptive of that that timbre, right? Okay, and then and then here you have the horns come in and they are going to even more absorb what's going on in the um, in your lower flute, and then right in here, the the texture gets more and more intense, and you're still sending your second flute all the way down to F sharp and E, right? And then it ends up sitting on an E, uh, which is the same exact note that the that is being played here by A uh, two, third and fourth horn, right? So where what's what is even the purpose? of scoring this E, right? Like you would be better off just allowing the English horn to take that pitch and not just not worry about it. If you needed to firm things up, maybe in the crescendo, you could go to ah two flutes on top. But look, if it's going to be invisible, don't score it, all right? It, it is just, you know, so it, that's not gonna ruin your texture, but, um, but it, 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 you know, it's going to, it's really just not contributing a whole lot. And then, all right, then we have this other problem, which is it's something which really makes me wish, you know, I, I, I want to know, Gerrit, that you have gone back and watched some of the other videos that are a part of this series, all right? Because I, this is another mistake I feel that you are too good of an orchestrator to make. And that is dropping the piano phrasing onto, onto the winds. Right, so so the piano phrasing is is just showing the piano player how to connect things smoothly, right? Like what is a musical statement, and here's the next musical statement, here's the next musical statement. Make everything under these nice and smooth. But then you end up with a slur over repeated notes. Now, what does that mean? What do you intend that to mean? Do you intend this to be for the for these players? 
these wind players to play sort of legato, kind of like a legato tongued kind of a kind of a phrase? Um, do you intend them to be playing sort of portato, kind of like um, that's you know, generally when you put a slur over repeated notes and then you have maybe a tenuto marking on each one, then the um, then the wind player um, attacks with the with pulsing from the stomach rather rather than the tongue, right? And more. So so look, it, you know, it, it's just I feel you're too good of an orchestrator to make that mistake. You know, why are you making that mistake? <laughs> okay. Sorry, I don't mean to be so confrontational, but I, I just really want you to think about what you're doing, right? Some of the basics. Um, you know, and, and just think about it, like, wouldn't you rather have these repeated notes individually articulated very clearly? You know, ta, 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 then maybe slur here, ta, right? Rather, rather than ta, 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 or ta, ta, do you know what I mean? It just like, it just feels so mushy and shapeless, right? You really need to just, you know, to stop dropping piano style phrasing onto winds and strings, all right? So that is the lesson here, right? And then here you've got like bassoons and clarinets and English horns doing the same thing, right? right when they the the clarity of the articulation would be at the, at its most useful for you right now here um you have this beautiful soft texture did you hear in the mock-up how loud like you know even marked down to piano like the horns came in and they just you know they they are serving a subsidiary like a very a very secondary supportive purpose right in here which is to prolong that tone at the bottom um, forwards, right? So so they should really be marked pianissimo. And then the same thing in here. Did you hear that they come in so, like you already have so much weight on these thirds. Now you're adding more, even more weight with the horns, right? You can hear it in the mock-up. You should really be softer, all right? Now, now here we have mezzo forte piano. So like, Okay, so I'm I'm on board with forte piano. I'm on board with fortissimo piano. I'm on board with forte pianissimo. Okay, but mezzo forte piano. What do you really mean there? What you mean is an accented piano mark, right? So you just really want you know the you want the emphasis at the beginning. So mezzo forte piano is really more of an accented piano. Okay, so I just just I would just say just make it simpler. Just put an accent on your piano dynamic, right? And I think that you will be fine. You'll get the same basic effect. Okay. Now here, which instrument is playing? Are these horns A2? Are they, um, is this just the first solo player? And then here you're adding even more weight to that same written B sounding E, the same note that's being played here by this poor benighted second flute player, right? He just does not have a chance here. He's not contributing a thing from this point onwards. And then even less when you add the horn on top or the, the first or maybe first and second horns, right? So just really think about some of these things. All right, now here you absolutely do not need to tie half note to half note to half note or dotted half note to dotted half note to dotted half note. You don't need to do that. All you need is a dotted whole note tying across here because like if you had a diminu diminuendo mark that you, like a hairpin that you really wanted to start right on this beat, then yeah, tie them. That way the player knows when to start the diminuendo. But if you don't have that, you don't need this. You don't need this tie at all. It's just, it's just extra, you know, it's extra information that is completely unnecessary. This should just be a single tied octave of, you know, dotted whole note value, right? Tying to this. And the same thing here. You know, this should be a dotted whole note. Right? Just like this. See? So much simpler. Now, um, some orchestrators have been using the crescendo and diminuendo marks that are in the original piano score without giving them really any meaning or context. Now, you didn't do that here. You showed us the destination that you were headed. So I want everybody to pay attention who's been following this. Right, so <clears throat> crescendo, 
to mezzo forte, diminuendo to pianissimo. There's been a few um, discussions about this recently in music engraving tips and in uh, and in orchestration online. And I really feel that like the crescendo mark shouldn't be used for more than two bars, right? So you're saying crescendo, and then you and then you you should try to have some sort of destination dynamic or some kind of thing. Like right here, this is perfect crescendo, and we end up with a mezzo forte here. Um, same thing with diminuendo. But like if you're going to go like three to four bars, then it should be poco a poco crescendo, right? So then the player knows, and then. And then in a situation like this, what you should do in Sibelius is this. Um, so we're giving ourselves a diminuendo hairpin, and then now we're going to make it invisible with um, Shift, Command, or Control, H, right? So that way in the playback, it will get softer rather than like you could hear in the mock-up that suddenly everything toned down very, very quickly right at the end of the bar. Or, or going into the next bar rather than it being a, a gradual diminuendo, right? So just just remember this, right? The invisible hairpin. Now, um, I actually I think I supplied some invisible hairpins in the um, in the um, in the template. So you know, if you erase those, then you know maybe that was a mistake. So or maybe you wrote this all out by yourself. I don't know. Anyways, it's really good. So you know, so like, don't take my, uh, don't take too much of my um, of my picking apart and scolding um, as like any indication that you're not doing something great here. Really sounds fantastic. If, if there would be one thing that I would kind of uh, wish for this would be a little bit more of a progression just within this prologue of of texture, timbre, emotional meaning, right? See, because it's more like right in here, I felt that like in terms of emotional context, it is really kind of stuck in the same, uh, the same basic textural picture, the same sound picture, right? So it just really is kind of this starts off really, you know, this beautiful, uh, somewhat tragic uh, sounding winds, and then you're just basically adding horns and making the making things a little bit more intense, and so on. And then you just kind of end the same way, right? So, so possibly consider in a if you're faced by this again, you know, you've got ten bars of of prologue. How much meaning can you get out of it? How you know how much can you progress the texture from place to place, from sound to sound, from you know from approach to approach, in a way that really shapes things, right? Um, so, so, you know, in that way, like I felt that this doesn't necessarily address my, um, my critique of, or my, so, sorry, my, um, my criterion of, um, a, an emotional and timbral progression. There's a bit of an, a of a timbral progression, but I think, you know, emotionally there's, you know, there's a bit of a surge here, but it doesn't. And I really like this stark ending, but I think that you could probably get more emotion out of this. Uh, I think in a situation like this where you have piano and then you have a nuance here, um, you know, crescendo to diminuendo, you don't need to restate the piano dynamic, right? We, we know that we know that it's still piano. Okay, but other than that, like, really great beginning you know just just you know try not to score low flute i mean i've said it so many times in these <laughs> so many times in these challenges don't score low flute in a way that makes it invisible okay so it's going to be invisible here all right okay so sorry i don't mean to scold so much but i mean i, I feel like i'm saying it and nobody's listening right um i think i might just have a big i think i might just have a checklist for the next challenge and just like people can go down the checklist and just like it'll have a lot of the problems that have come up time after time and, you know the problem with it is that it just distracts me from other things I could be saying about your work when I sort of see the same mistake again and again but I really love the you know the the combination of clarinets and bassoons we've seen that in a few other scores I think it's very elegantly stated right in here and I really love the idea of the English horn and the first flute in octaves right and I think the second flute is just basically you know, for the first five bars, eh, sort of, it's sort of somehow a little bit useful. I say up to right about around here where you bring the horns in. 
right? So if you make the horn softer, then I think that the second flute can sort of be useful, but it's still way out of balance. And then when you get to here, it's just completely useless, right? It just it'll just get swallowed up by everybody else. All right, next page. Now on this second screen, um, I think that this is all really beautifully scored. There, I'm going to have a few little critiques here and there, but you know, for the most part, I feel it's beautifully done, and I think that there's some really nice. Uh, treatment of the parts and the horns and so on. Uh, one one little thing you know, before I it, I forget what to say, and that is that in some ways, like the timbre of this passage here is very closely related to what happened before, and part of that is the fact that you've got flute and clarinet working in octaves with you know your first violins and second violins, right? So there is like you just have to ask yourself, you know, in terms of proportions and and like um, moving forwards, whether like continuing to use flute as the high voice so much is really progressing things, right? Do, does, does, does it really even need uh, flute and clarinet to be doubling this, you know, the, the melody and octaves and the strings, right? Because it, it just ends up kind of sounding very much the same as the prologue, right? And the prologue itself, like you sort of set a trap for yourself by not really shifting any of the, the timbres around or changing, you know, changing the context of anything. So really, you know, we just really, it, it just feels very much like, um, like a flute piece, right? We're just kind of stuck in those things. And I, like normally I wouldn't be like this, picking, uh, picking apart this, so much but like you're you know by the quality of your scoring here you're showing me that you need more challenging right in terms of like the your overall picture of how the um of how things should work right so so that's you know that is just my challenge to you is like how how different of a quality can you get this and still get the beautiful smooth sound that you've got in here Right now, some people won't have a problem with that, and that's perfectly fine. But like, I would say just you know the fact that you didn't really progress the texture before, and the flute was on top the entire time, and now the flute is still on top, right? And that you still have the idea of wind octaves in there, right? It just sort of almost feels like the the strings are just kind of sweetening what happened before, right? So it's not really moving forward as much in terms of, like it doesn't feel so much like a fresh start as it could be now. You know, the, to balance that, <clears throat> we have this really lovely uh, scoring. Um, I, I really, I really, really like the way that you took um, the um, the left hand patterns, the whole, you know, that that whole flowing thing, and you just turned it into its own uh, its own beautiful kind of uh, energy that was not necessarily reliant on. On the cello part, it just really is this nice flow that goes through the music, and yeah. So, yeah. Oh, now once again, okay. Poco a poco crescendo, right? You could be just dropping in an invisible. Uh, oops, you could be dropping in an invisible dynamic here, right? And then in the playback for your mock-up, you get that poco a poco crescendo, right? Or you could just put in the hairpin and get rid of the poco a poco crescendo. I, I wouldn't have long... Um, I, I try to avoid hairpins that are longer than about three bars. I'd say, you know, once you get to four, five, six bars, then the there's a danger that the hairpin is going to start looking like a bar line and just confuse everything, right? So, um, yeah, so just think about that trick, okay? Just Just, you know, think about having invisible dynamics because remember there there were some in the template right just to help everybody if they wanted to maintain barvinsky's um written <clears throat> some of his his uh, text dynamics right okay yeah so piano ben cantando just a little tip try to have two spaces between a dynamic mark and uh, you know, and an expression, an expression text that comes after it, right? Because you know, this sort of seems like a sentence. P ben cantando, right? So, but this looks like piano ben cantando, right? So you just leave a little bit more of a space. 
Okay, um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about the orchestration. So, so all context of what happened before aside, this is nicely scored, okay? I, I would say that like the strings, like here you broke up those long phrase marks, right? So, you know, and, and yeah, you want a really nice legato effect, right? Almost as if the listener is not hearing the break in Boeing here. But like, why couldn't you break it even further? Like down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So just turn this into, you know, turn it into this, right? Because like that, well, that way you've got the smooth winds on top. They're smoothing everything over, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so, and then you get even bows with your strings. Which, uh, excuse me, <laughs> there we go. That's what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, now here you have like a bit of unevenness, like in the in the articulation. Like you've got accents in your bassoons and horns, but slurs in your violas and cellos and uh, um, lower divisi second violins. <clears throat> Here you've got just a simple tie and then and a 16th note leading into the next accented note, right? Then here you've got accented staccato um, that is a sort of accented mezzo staccato because you've got the slur going forward, right? Does it need to be mezzo staccato? Or can't it just be, you know, and, and does it even need to be accented, right? Can't it just be a simple staccato leading to an accent here without the mezzo, right? So like whenever you do this, the slur, that just means it's less, it has less punch, right? You really want to avoid punchiness on this before you hit this accent, right? So it may, it may be, maybe this is just something that you, you didn't quite think about, right? But yeah, but it, you know, I wouldn't recommend mezzo staccato going to this apex right just going up to the highest note ba bum right don't you want it to be staccato accent not da da because like you know the it's just it's a moderated staccato but then you have the accent so it's just like it's all sort of working against everything's working against everything else putting an accent on a mezzo staccato right so think of well what does that mean right get like choose one or the other either get rid of the accent or get rid of the slur Right or or just get rid of the accent and the slur and just allow it just to be a simple staccato, right? Or make everybody accented, accented staccato. I mean, you've got accents in the other parts, right? But a little bit more unity here, I think, would be good. You know, rather than having like smooth smooth strings and accented uh, horns and and bassoons, right? I I just think that that it would be it would just would work like things flowing together, right? Anyway, um, so so now, like in terms of like the the bass, I, I thought it was kind of nice that you had you know you had more uh, more of that bass harmony going on here. It's really really separated, right? There's low uh, sounding D, right, and then two octaves below that we've got the arco basses on the bottom, and then pizzicato on top, right? So it sort of leaves a space in between, and yeah, of course, you know you. you You've got other things playing the D here and there and that are just part of the harmony and melody and so on from place to place. Uh, but yeah, but I, I mean, I think it's a cool effect. Don't get me wrong. All right? And then here you get closer together with your harmony. So um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think just some, some, so many fun things to this that, you know, that work, um, you know, work really, really well. Yeah, and I, and I really love the, the role of the horns in here. I think that that's that's pretty nicely done, and I and I love the fact that you're keeping them soft. See, why didn't you do that on the first page, right? You you know, even in a soft dynamic, that the horns are going to overwhelm. So why weren't they that way on the first screen, right? So yeah, just maybe a little bit more proofreading. You know, I mean, if you're going to put this much work, get this good at it, just really you know go back over it before you send it to me, and you know just think about the proportions of things and the balance and everything else. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, and then and then it seems to me like you sort of add you add oboe for emphasis from time like you did that on the first screen, and here you're you're doing it in the second one. You're just sort of pushing into this mezzo forte. Which oboe is it? Is this first oboe? 
right? Here you have Atu flute. So is this Atu oboes really thickening up the string line here, or is it just a single oboe, or, you know? I mean, you put staccatos on these players, and they will have enough punch here that you don't need an accent, right? Okay. All right, and then this just pushes into the next page where the harp starts to take on a more important role. And I think that this is some really great harp scoring, except, um, Gerrit, you, you've, been, <laughs> you've been witness to these um, orchestration challenges, right? And you've seen the results of many of these different things, and I'm sure you've done your own scoring. Do you really want the harp to be mezzo forte to everybody else's mezzo forte? Shouldn't the harp be more like forte, right? Um, I, I think that that would create a much better balance, and and I think that you could even have like, like you know, like little forte and then a crescendo push, right? So sort of like, um, so that the the as the left hand rises right in here, it, it just you know it it pushes into the bar each time. I think that that would you would end up with a much more prominent harp part in here. And then I really love how you are um, <clears throat> supporting the harp with uh, some of the other, you know, the, in the context of the other uh, lines that flow around. Uh, of course, by just throwing in this really high cello note in here, you take away the ability of the, of the cello to double these pitches in the bassoon. And, you know, and then you sort of have just notes that seem to repeat themselves in the violas and the and the clarinets right instead of really kind of tracking from all the way across i think this is where a like a, a bass clarinet would really come in handy um to, to thicken up the first uh, bassoon line even even just for these first um three pitches right in here <clears throat> but anyway you know if you're just going to if you're going to use the cellos in that way, or have divisi cellos with like with the the lower divisi cellos covering some of these lower notes along with the bassoon, I just think that would be a much smoother kind of approach. And um, yeah, you know, I mean, this I I I think that cellists can play this with no problem, but it's just a little yeah, it's a little clumsy. I mean, it, I would I would be tempted to divide this even further in terms of the slurring, right? Just a maybe like slur and then slur and then here it seems like we're kind of working at cross purposes here a little bit um yeah i mean this is all totally playable for the bassoons it's just you, you know there's there's kind of really no need to have a uh bassoons up there in the tenor register where they're quite that you know that exposed right i mean to to a degree like all of their pitches are doubled by violas cellos and so on um, so I mean, it does. It's 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 permissible. It's you know, it's not going to sound too awkward, but it's you know, between the players themselves, I mean, there's really nothing here that could not just be played by a single bassoon and sound better. I would say, you know, and, and I would say, it's especially in you know, in light of just like holding this low A and then suddenly hopping up, you know, a tenth and then playing this little thing and then jumping down again and so on. I mean, I just I just feel that it just it would be better if this were the first bassoon playing this. And then you don't really need the second bassoonist at all, right in there, and that just helps them be a little clearer in, you know, in their breathing, their approach, and everything else. And even like this could be divided across two players if you wanted to. Not that there's anything, you know, there's really kind of nothing that can't be played just by, uh, by both bassoonists all the way across. Yeah, but I mean, just you know, in terms of finessing things to make things as convenient and smooth and so on and so forth which is part of your concern right you were finessing things all the way and right in here you know you're you know you're you're dividing your section and so on yeah i mean so if you're going to be that into that much into finessing then you should think about finessing some of these parts to just cut out any possibility of awkwardness and then that kind of approach helps the harp speak a little clearer but you know like uh, the don't get me wrong like by just really having the only companion here um being first bassoon in this upward motion here um it's a lot clearer for the harpist but here's the problem okay is that your harp 
and your other low instruments are not playing the same pitches, right? And, and, and what is the result of that is a lack of clarity. All right, and that leads us to the entire problem that you are setting yourself right in here. You've got this big, beautiful harp solo, right? It's solo. This is, this is more important than that, right? When you say solo here and you don't say solo there, by the way, the proper place for this is right here. Okay. All right. So, um, so when you, when you have the harp as the prominent instrument, this really is what is going to be heard. So uh, this poor clarinet player right in here, who's actually playing the original line is, you know, that there is like the, because of the because of the difference between these plucked tones and this kind of smoother suave slurred clarinet the harp is going to win every time and whatever whatever meaning you had in this is going to be completely secondary all right if if everything is balancing the way that you want it to balance <clears throat> So that is something to think about if you are if you are tempted to do something like this where you're harmonizing, right? So like, I mean, how could you get out of this? I mean, you could you could have instead of having this be a single line in the harp, you could have the harp kind of play some of the other pitches that are going on in the other instruments as things rise, you know, so that you've got like intervals right here except instead of a single line and then you would get more of the meaning of this line. But then that might spoil the effect, right? So like so so long as you are willing to accept that it's you know that it's it's not going to be perfect at all then you know then that is kind of what you're going to get all right so um i see absolutely no need like you know right in here your mezzo forte and you're playing a high g with your first horn right all right now here you're going diminuendo so why couldn't this just be the English horn on top, right? Because like a pian like piano, high G, eh, you know, a little difficult, but doable. But then diminuendo to pianissimo, and you just really want this to, be to beautifully blend, you know, behind the, behind the harp. So, you know, like let's say you're working with a like a semi-pro orchestra or something that that high G may end up being really really loud where like the 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 English horn player is basically playing the same pitch could do the same thing and just bring it down to just a very soft pianissimo right so maybe you should just cut this and let the let the English horn player take that high G right now having said that you know a total stone cold pro could you know, easily play a high G up. They wouldn't like it. <laughs> you know, they might just kind of shake their head. And, oh man, pianissimo high notes. All right, let's do it. And then they play it perfectly. But like, it's really not not quite in keeping with the with the kind of tendencies of what the horn wants to do above the staff, right? So yeah. So I mean, you can see it's marked in red, and you know, I would say that that redness. Um, I would interpret that more to do with you know, with like what you're asking it to do dynamically. Of course, though, the Sibelius doesn't work that way, but you know, that's that sort of red flag to me. I'm just thinking about like controlling the dynamics way up high there. And the thing about it is too, like, like um, when you start getting into the upper register, um, pianissimo, piano, and so on and so forth becomes um, a moderation of the intensity of the playing, but it doesn't necessarily temper the dynamic. Right, so you might end up with a really like you know, for the horn a pianissimo, for everybody else a mezzo forte, right? So just because the because like you can't get rid of the overtones up there, and you can't get rid of the of this just the prominence of this high note, right? Which is also, by the way, sort of is messing with the rest of your chord. You can hear it in the you can hear it in the mock up, right? So I think for that beautiful luminous color, just let the English horn do its job up there right and maybe even like mark everybody like i mean you could just start the pianissimo here in your horns right do a little diminuendo here start the pianissimo here in the horns and then just don't go diminuendo just have them continue on right i think that that might be a better way of handling some of the problems right in here and then this is all nice you know this is nicely done 
you know, once again, this would sound better. I feel this would sound better, more natural on a uh, on a bass clarinet right in here. See, so like if you wanted to bring bass clarinet in here, there's just so many things that could edit that it could fix. All right. Yeah, and then this is really nice coming in here. I almost think that like this could have also been solo violin as well, right? Just to match the intimacy of the solo harp that happened before. It could even be solo flute, right? Okay, all right. Well, I'll I'll stop talking about flute <laughs> and let's move to the next page. Now, in this section, my um, evaluation criteria. Uh, say calm surface over restless undercurrent and you definitely have that in here it is really beautifully done um, and you know emotional and textural progression from sound to keep things from sounding repetitive you definitely have got that in here staying subtle and not overemphasizing the pulse uh, yeah more or less and um, the middle voice adding color and intensity definitely all right so you bas basically checked a lot of those boxes Really nice. I, I like this little idea in, in here, the, the broken, you know, broken third study. Do -de -do -de. I think it's very playable. Harpists, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, I feel that this all works really nicely. Of course, in a situation like this, you really should have a nice, you know, some nice slurs over the harps. Just really kind of show them the groupings of like, you know, of the of the phrases overall. I think it just really kind of helps form a picture in the harpist's mind, right? Um, and, you know, to the extent that this is all just kind of one line, you could also possibly just, uh, you know, take out all of the opposite voice uh, rests, right? So it's just like there was a one continuous line flowing across the staves, right? Leave in, leave in this rest, right? These rests. But, like, you could take out the ones in the opposite hand that isn't doing anything. Um, and then just put a big slur over it. That's, that's another way of, of managing this, you know, scoring it. Now the other thing too is like the <clears throat> there is a problem here with the dynamics. I feel okay, so several right now. You see, like here you have some nuances, you're kind of pushing forwards a little bit, you know, crescendo, crescendo, and so on. Um, but I think that you could have had more nuances here uh, in your in your oboe part and your horns and so on. You know, da da da. Da, da, da. What do you mean here with a slur over this and then a slur here? What does that mean? All right, please, please do not just dump uh, piano slurring, right? This is something that was in the piano score, right? That there was a slur over it and just like, you know, Harry, you are too smart for this. You're too smart to make that mistake. All right, don't use the piano slurs when you transcribe things all right just really think about that you know what what does each individual instrument do what does it mean what how does it speaking what is it articulating right because like this is just kind of nonsense right to leave this slur in here all right you can do better i know you can you're you really yeah i'm seeing such excellent orchestration here all right so really think about that really proofread some of this stuff out next time all right and, and just like in terms of like like getting nice clarity from your horns i think you could just completely get rid of most of these long slurs you know wouldn't it sound better if they're going da, 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 and then maybe slur here ta, 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 ta. and then you know, no need to slur here ta, ta. Ta, ta. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's better to have the enunciation on it. Just like you're doing here on the violas, which by the way, this is a beautiful effect. Oboe on top, horns below, uh, doubled by um, R3 violas. Such a great idea. You know, just so nice. Now, like, I feel, I feel that you fell into a trap here though, right? Because, uh, you know, what was something, I think it's in the, it's in the, um, if it's not, then I'm going to put it in, but it's in the, um, like, like in the uh, 12 common scoring errors. You do not have to follow the dynamics of the score, right? Just because it was pianissimo in the, um, the, the sort of the left-hand patterns were pianissimo in the piano score. I mean, does that mean that the, 
that the that this should be pianissimo no not at all because like you can barely hear it right you just sort of hear this kind of soft kind of backgroundy stuff and it really has almost no impact on the music whatsoever bring this up to piano and then you will hear the beautiful arcing through the music i would say leave the timpani at pianissimo because like um not overemphasizing the pulse here really really important thing right so you don't want this to turn into kind of a uh, you know a, a silly little waltz you know doo -doo -boo, doo -doo -boo, doo -doo. so i mean it doesn't sound that way but i think if you brought the timpani forwards then it would sound a bit like kind of a little circus waltz right but this is nice the way that you've got it here i'd say just bring this forward piano right piano dynamic and you know let the let the melody breathe right just you know pushing into here pulling out pushing in pulling out and then here an overall crescendo but like here like this is really unclear dynamics okay so now like before you know a couple screens ago you supplied a destination dynamic but i'm not seeing one here right like crescendo um crescendo to what well what are we going crescendo to where do we end up is this you know, is this end up being forte and then diminuendo from the forte, right? So you, you can't just use words, you can't just drop words in there like exactly the way that the piano score was. I, you know, it might mean something in the piano score, but it's not, you know, it, it is not the what you should do because these players need more guidance than that. And so does the conductor for that matter, right? Uh, you know, they... You know, piano uh, piano crescendo right so so I'm assuming that you end up at around forte or or mezzo forte or something like that right so just make it clearer in that way right and yeah maybe you don't even need this crescendo marking right just you know you've already got the hairpins pushing forward and then you just you know have the or you know you could you could get rid of the hairpins and say crescendo and then have a have a destination dynamic and then a hairpin you know say the diminuendo hairpin at the end right okay so um i like the low horn in here right um yeah so but the thing about this is that like when you have a low pitch like that in the horns it really needs you know this is this is a low sounding g written d right okay it really needs some bolstering yeah you know like you've got this fourth horn just sort of hanging off the bottom of the staff here and that's what it feels like to just be the sole player down there playing you know and so it's just a it's just a um a little word of advice that is given in so many orchestration manuals like if you're if you're having very low horn like this try to double them just give them some other voice that they can kind of hang on to and and shape their playing right and once again you know who would solve that bass clarinet plays beautifully alongside uh, horn and because they both have that like un you know they have no vibrato right so they both can just really hang on to that and have the um you know have that sort of real unified sound okay so please no pedantry about like you know the very slow vibrato that is used to sort of shape sound shape you know what we think of as non vibrato you know what i mean when i say that it's not vibrato okay and i know what the difference between you know a uh like a sine wave which has no vibrato and uh and you know and a shaped a very shaped slow modulation of the tone right i i know the difference all right so i think we're i think we've all reached the stage where we can you know where we can say non vibrato on something that has a slow vibrato okay all right all right so um yeah so and then just yeah so just don't use don't use piano, you know, don't use the piano slurs as, you know, telling people how to breathe, where to breathe and stuff. And just really think more for yourself about like where you want the emphasis on the uh, articulation, on the articulated note, okay? And this is all real cool right in here, I like this. Okay, so you wouldn't have to say one, two here, right? Because you only have two flutes, right? You just say ah, two, 
You don't have to say one and two. In fact, you don't even need the doubled note heads. You just say a ah, two, and with just you know, and then here it goes to an goes to an octave, and then obviously it's two players. All right, and now finally for a fully fleshed, <laughs> fully organized, very very well worked out section D. Okay, very cool. Not to say that earlier attempts that I have or um, evaluated so far have not been up to snuff. That's not it at all. It's, it's just that there have been sort of a little bit of signs of slight incompleteness or being rushed or something in a, in, in a few spots, right? So, but here I, I feel, Gerrit, that you did a lot of work on this and you just really, you know, thought about using all of your resources and, and everything else. Okay. All right. However, <clears throat> I feel that, like, having like a crescendo poco a poco right in these instruments and not like and and having a forte scored here for your heavy brass okay. without giving these players any kind of guidance as to as to whether they should match up or what right there's there's you know you are you're shooting yourself in the foot right so and and once again right like here you've got this you got this crescendo here but that like and the Sibelius will interpret this just to go from pianissimo up to piano, right? That's all that Sibelius understands. It doesn't understand that you want to get all the way up to matching the the heavy brass here. So you know, I mean, what's a match for big, bright, heavy brass here? It's like fortissimo in these parts. And then here, like you have pianissimo once again. I think this falls into the trap of scoring. The exact same dynamics as the, um, you know, as the written part, right? So, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. Thing you've got pianissimo marked in the piano score, and then like the piano in the middle, right? But that's, you know, this is not going to work, right? And you can hear it in the mock-up, right? That just you can barely hear any of this other stuff happening, and it really isn't, you know, it isn't really playing much of a role. Now, horns, pianissimo. I'm totally on board with that's fine okay but but the, these parts right in here definitely should be piano and the, they should increase quickly so that by the time they get here they are forte or fortissimo in in some kind of an attempt to balance here and I think the horns can come up to forte as well okay so it just really needs to be scored a lot more clearly in terms of your, of your dynamics now everything else like about this it works pretty well Okay, um, I, I really love the bass trombone part here. I like the way that you've got the harmony worked out in the trombones and everything else. I like this, you know, just the the um, your your big triple fanfare right in here with your with your trumpets and so on. I almost wish that there was some way of sort of subtly bringing in more and more of the trumpets until they were all kind of nice and warmed up and then they could just really hit this nicely together like you know maybe like first trumpet and then a two and then with the with the third trumpet starting to double what's going on in the in the um, trombones right in here you know more softly and then and then by the time they get to here they're a bit more warmed up you know that's one way that you could do that. Like Lily Boulanger was the master of that, <laughs> you know. Like, give you know, just write something, score something into the orchestration so that the uh, that the brass had a chance to just sort of warm up their lips a little bit, and then they're ready for anything, right? But that's okay. I mean, this is all totally doable. There's there's no problem there, especially with a professional orchestra. But anyways, but I just felt like, you know, the balance is just really off on this page. Um, just you know, it's all about the heavy brass. You can't really hear anything else, hardly at all, right? Um, you, know, you, you know that that isn't the way forward, right? So, yeah, so really, these parts need to be piano. If it's crescendo, poco a poco, you have to tell us what the dynamic here is. And, you know, in your, in your mock-up, you've got to score in invisible dynamics, right? Right? So that it comes out, right? And then even if you were not going to tell us what where the destination was you could put in invisible dynamics in your score but you should tell us right you should tell all these parts that they are playing they're at least playing loud enough to match what's going on in the heavy brass or slightly be you know slightly behind them like if you were to mark everybody forte in all these other parts they would be slightly behind the or or very much behind 
the heavy brass right in here because you know you're pushing towards these higher pitches like all the way up to f sharp here in the c trumpet you know and and you know you're going up into the tenor registers uh, f uh, c sharp and f sharp with your trombone and so on a nice high a sharp in your bass trombone so like this stuff is just going to really punch right through anybody's you know like you could have everybody surging here and just going furious um you know like just you know playing octaves or playing you know playing tremolo in massive chords and so on and you would still hear this punching through really loudly right so it doesn't really need to get all that loud but yeah you know but in terms of like the scoring it's it's all you know there's kind of you know not a whole lot to really say about it it's, it all works fine with these instruments I don't know if you really need A2 in your clarinets. Yeah, you know. Anyway. But, I mean, playing soft, but like as they get louder and louder, they're going to get sounding more and more phased. Right? All right, and then continuing on, I really like the way that you changed from like the big heavy brass chords and you sort of gave it over to more of a traditional tutti with uh you know with um blended winds and strings and you know that scoring as far as this goes is really nicely done i, f I feel in both parts um and it's interesting that like you don't have any slurs or anything in your um your lower string parts that's just going to give things more of kind of like a, a kind of a heaving sound you know um and then like right in here you've got the the um, the timpani sort of plowing away on this. I think that this is kind of secondary. I mean, I know what you want here. You want to, you know, you want to jump the octave and so on. I, I think it would be better to write that out. You know, as just just write to write out the the destination pitch rather than, you know. I mean, because because like you know, what are you like the fingering on this is a little strange, right? Because like the I'm sort of working it out. Yeah, you know, you've got that D and then, yeah, I mean, just, just write out the destination pitch that you intend there with a, you know, without the diamond head and just, just make it clearer. Um, yeah. But, you know, as far as everything else goes, I think the scoring is really nice, actually. And I like the, the horn pad behind it. It's really cool, and that the you know the first trumpet kind of keeping keeping things forceful here, right? And then the uh, harp glissandos and so on. Now, did you notice that you you can't even hear the harp glissando here? And you know what is that telling you, right? It just it's just the the texture is getting too big for that, right? Okay, so here you're going to <laughs> um, just this massive massive. I'm playing right here you know i i think that it's just a long time to be just hitting that really really um a really really high note in here that really high b yeah i mean i mean yeah it's 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 playable yeah i guess it's all right it's just yeah I mean, this is really going to sound way different than it is in the um, in the mock-up, right? And like, the, you know, who gets the worst part of the deal is the you know are these strings? Now, why couldn't these strings be doubled by horns? Right. So this whole line in here is really going to be essentially lost, right? So you're going to hear the winds, the the upper winds hammering away. On this, and you're gonna hear like this big foghorn down here, bassoons and tuba and and double basses and everything else. That's all great. And you're gonna wow, are you gonna be able to hear the <clears throat> heavy brass right in here? That's all gonna come through beautifully. Okay, but like this, you know, da 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 da. da right, it's just you know, and couldn't like like this note in the middle have played a you know, you know, da 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 ba da da, right? You know, just like so, you get the ba 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 da 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 da, right? So like you just get more rather than this gap, right? 
it's okay if the notes are doubling what's going on in the in the heavy brass for just one pitch, right? You just you get you end up with a nice sense of flow in the parts. But yeah, but like look, these horns are just sitting around doing nothing, right? And they could be helping out so much. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say that I really love the timpani right in here. It's a beautiful solution on how to make this more effective. Make just give it way more punch. Great, really great touch. It's something I wish I'd thought of. Right, really nice. Um, <clears throat> all right, so so that's my thoughts on that. Now, now here, like we're headed for disaster with this high C sharp. Okay, all right. Now some some trumpet players can hit that no problem. I, you know, I think that, you know, I think that the player will just feel it if you go da 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 bum, and then like just have a triple unison <laughs> on the C sharp, da 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 da, right? I mean, but like in the in the ear, like the overtones from this will fill in that high note, right? And if you're really worried about it, excuse me, you could, sorry, yeah, you could like have the piccolo come in and just like bah bah bum and play like I'm sorry I keep going the wrong direction here and then you know just have like that real high like an, an octave higher than this C sharp kind of holding that da, 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 and then maybe cut out here um, but yeah but yeah, I, I wouldn't score a high C sharp for your C trumpet player I mean if you really want this high note then do what I did you know, use an E flat trumpet right and it just makes it as easy as pie, right? That note is perfectly playable. All right, and then you know here, like we have the horns going dun 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 dun. You know, what I mean, and but what about these poor strings right in here, right? Like they're just once again like their their function of the kind of rising and falling um, energy is just getting buried now by the by the horns when the horns could be helping out the strings in pro, in you know communicating that idea right so i think you're i think you're missing something in here right or or you could have the horns take over on these repeated notes and you could have your clarinets and english horn and oboes double what's going on in in the your your uh, cellos and violins and so on right so yeah so one way or another this needs more support it's just not going to do it on its own you know you're scoring lower strings against massive high brass high heavy brass and you know the answer to that is invisibility right and you can hear it in the mock-up all right and this is all cool here the rolled timpani and so on yeah it's all really fun and then stentato ba 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 bum and then right in here like finally we can hear the strings a little bit right but i mean i just, once again I, I just feel like there needs to be more support on the on the melodic arc right in here even if it was just the first violins now what if the what if the heavy brass were to suddenly you know switch roles right what if like what if you had some of your um some of your middle winds helping the strings right in here and then you had the heavy brass helping the strings right at the end but i mean it is all really really heavy I, i'm not even sure you need to do anything but yeah i think that the diminuendo has to start from from the downbeat and not wait so long right because you have to think like what's what is happening in a piano you hit the chord and the chord starts to decay right so that's where the decay comes from that's where the diminuendo starts Right, not to be too slavish to the piano, but like, what's the context of the non decrescendo and then ending, and then this, then this part coming in, kind of you know sneakily from the bottom, right? Is that it's using the de natural decay of the piano, so I think that that means that it starts from the downbeat. Anyways, that's my interpretation of it, but I just felt it like kind of went on a little too long. Anyhow, like really great score. I mean. I could I could sit here and talk about it all day, and I better stop before I actually do that. So, um, just re my you know remains for me to thank you, Gerrit, for your your lovely effort that you uh, that you put into this score, and just you know, and really you know, even though I'm sort of scolding you here about this and reminding you of that, and correcting you on such and such, and pointing out a different strategy that might work a little bit better here and there. It doesn't mean that I think that you didn't do a great job here. I think it's really phenomenal, right? You know, but if if 
you were, you know, if you could orchestrate perfectly, you wouldn't need my help, right? <laughs> so that's all this is about, is just to point out ways of making the approach that you thought of, you know, your approach, your conception of this piece even stronger if I can, right? And I think it is already very strong. You know, just like the last, um, the last entry, uh, Dave Nedweck's um, uh, entry, that, which just was so phenomenal, you know, just needed a little bit of patching up and, you know, a little bit of tweaking to get ready for the stands, right? For a reading or a performance. And just, you know, just as strongly, I would encourage this score as well. You know, if you have any connection to an orchestra that wants to play something by a Ukrainian composer to show their solidarity with those musicians, this would be a piece to do that, or this would be a, a, a score that could work for that, right? So think about all those things. You know, if you if you have a connection to somebody, you know, whether it's a youth orchestra, a community orchestra, a big professional orchestra or something like that, that might want to play this, you know, run it by them. But fix it up a little bit first, okay? So so thank you so much for um, you know, continuing to participate in these in these uh, challenges and you know we're just putting so much of your heart into this and and for supporting the channel it just really means a lot i appreciate it so much and uh you know and and also just you know by participating on patreon you are also supporting the um ukrainian musicians i i i've been in communication with the charity and i'm about to transfer funds over to them so yeah, we really supported a bunch of people over there. So, um, yeah, so thanks for all of that. Thank you, everybody watching out there. You know what to do. If you have some ideas that would be helpful, something constructive to say, write it below if you haven't already. And, you know, thanks to all of those other Patreon supporters and all of the website subscribers, everybody out there watching in the audience. I really, really appreciate you sticking around here to the end of the video. And um, I've, there's more in score. There, there's more in score. There's more in store of these scores uh, coming up over the following three or four weeks. All right. So just, you know, stand by because there is more awesome stuff to come. Thanks, everybody.